We really can't believe that we're almost at uh, at Christmas. Boy, I tell you what, you know, ready or not. As for me, uh, Christmas just kind of gets too stressful sometimes, I think. <laughs> um, well, we're going to look, be looking tonight about um, about how God wants to transform our life. I think sometimes with our... Uh, um, I think sometimes with our prayers and uh, even with our faith a lot of times, we just kind of get reach a place of... Uh, We just kind of reach a place of, um, I think, lower expectations. You know, um, we're like when we pray, um, somebody brought a noisy baby. Oh, wait, it's me. <laughs> uh, where sometimes, you know, when, when we pray, um, it's like our prayers, we don't even believe what we're praying. You know what I mean? You guys are all just kind of look a little tired tonight. You you all are acting like I feel. And <laughs> well, anyways, um, for instance, one of the prayers that that, um, that I myself have even prayed a lot is it, it, it sounds like a good prayer in and of itself. You know, God, if you would just get them saved. You know, God, I'm praying that you would. You would save this person, whatever. Just get them saved, you know. And, and, and it sounds good, but in our heart, this is what we're thinking. There's such a lost cause. If you could just sneak them into heaven, that'd be great. You know, I'm not asking for anything big or major. Just sneak them in the back door or whatever. Whatever you got to do, God, just, just, you know, whatever. And, you know, that's kind of what I want to talk about. God doesn't want to just, um, how to say this? Like, I... The thing is, is I've heard a sermon very similar to this many times, and it was very judgmental and just very hard to swallow. And so I'm trying to say something similar to what I've heard before in my life, but without it being, um, uh, for lack of a better word, douche, jerkish. Um, so anyways, uh, and that's kind of what I want to talk about. The way that God doesn't want to just save us, he wants to transform our life. Um, so we, we talk about how, you know, we're saved, whatever that means, but we then we live our lives on our own, on our own accord, and, and our prayers are shallow, they don't really ever, you know what I mean, we, we, we pray prayers that just don't really get anywhere, we go through the motions of what we're expected to do, and especially around the, hol the, hol the holidays, you know, because we're all sad around this time of year, so it's like, well, I guess we're supposed to look happier or something, so I'll... Go to a candlelight service, I guess, and, you know, whatever. But then we're still left with that, you know, after the candlelight service, after the Christmas services, after all these things, we're still left with that emptiness, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, that's really what I want to talk about, because God doesn't want us to live a spiritually empty life. Yeah. And sometimes we allow our external things, you know, uh, maybe a job or different family conflicts, to take away that spiritual joy that God wants us to have. And uh, so we're going to be looking at the book of Malachi. Um, it's the last book of the Old Testament, um, the, the book right before the Gospel of Matthew. If you want to turn there, you can. You don't have to. Um, God, and I want to leave you with this idea. God doesn't want to just save us. You know, I think that in the church, we, we emphasize a lot about salvation, about how God wants to save us. I think that's good. I absolutely think that God wants to save us. But God wants to do more in us than just simply salvation. You know what I mean? And, and I, I don't want to downgrade salvation. I think that salvation has become something that we don't fully understand. I'm going to heaven, but I'm going to live my life miserable. I'm going to heaven, but you know I don't have to love anybody. I don't have to forgive anybody. I'm going to heaven, but in the meantime, I'm going to make life a living hell for everyone around me. Yeah, well, how is that salvation? And so we're going to look at the prophet Malachi. Malachi was possibly the last prophet um, to prophesy before Jesus came. Um, somewhere in the 400s BC, and Jesus came in about 6 BC, he was born, um, died around 30 uh, AD. 
So, you know, there's about 400 years there, but we're just not quite sure where in 400 BC it could have happened. Uh, it was either right before Ezra, or during the time of Nehemiah, or just after the time of Nehemiah. So that kind of gives us, you know, a couple decades to work with there um, in the 400s, somewhere around, you know, the 450s to the 430s BC. Um, if you're into history, that's really important for you. If, like most people around here, you don't care, you're giving me that look like, why should I care? <laughs> So, anyways, my, my point being here that it's sometime around when the books of Ezra and Nehemiah were written. Now, in the Hebrew Bible, uh, Ezra and Nehemiah are one unit together. And in, the English, in the English Bible that we have, it, Ezra and Nehemiah are separated. But, um, you know, in the original, that, that's not really how, how they had the books. Um, kind of like a part one and part two, if you will. So, uh, Malachi starts up in chapter one, verses two through five. And this is, what, this is what it says. I have loved you, says the Lord, yet you ask, how have you loved us? Wasn't Esau Jacob's brother? This is the Lord's declaration. Even so, I loved Jacob, but I hated Esau. I turned his mountains into a wasteland and gave his inheritance to the desert jackals. Though Edom says, we have been devastated, but we will rebuild the ruins. The Lord of armies says this, they may build, but I will demolish. They will be called a wicked country, and the people um, the Lord has cursed forever. So, this is the first thing I want to look at. God doesn't want us to simply be saved. God wants us to turn from evil and know his love. God wants us to experience a new life. If you look what he says here, I have loved you, says the Lord. And then he goes on to, to this example about how Esau and Jacob, but Jacob is basically the, the what is the word, progenitor, um, forefather of Israel. And Esau is the, for, uh, the forefather of uh, Edom. And Edom wasn't included in the promise, but Israel was. Now, we know here in the New Testament age, the, the Christian church, you know, we've been grafted into the tree. What does that mean? We don't have to be, you know, um, we aren't saved by bloodline, we're saved by the Spirit. We've been adopted as heirs um, by God. So with that being said, um, this has a whole different meaning to us, but I hope you can kind of get what I'm saying here. Um, I'm rambling, so I'm just going to move on to point two here. Uh, verses six through seven of that same uh, chapter. A son honors his father and a servant his master, but if I'm a father, where is my honor? And if I'm a master, where is your fear of me? Says the Lord of armies to you priests who despise my name. Yet you ask, how have we despised your name? Verse seven, by presenting defiled food on my altar. How have, how have we defiled you, you ask, when you say the Lord's table is contemptible? So God wants us to give him our best. God wants us to live a life which is not sneaking by. God wants us to invest in him. God wants us to, I don't know what other word, invest. He wants us to, to, to lay all of our cards, to bet the full bet on him. You know what I mean? He wants us to be um, so assured of what he has promised, so confident in him that our life is about him. I was listening to a song that was basically, I really wish I could remember the words, but even if I could, I wouldn't be able to on the spot. Um, it was basically about, may the memory of me be of you. And I don't remember exactly what the song was. I wish I could, but I don't really think it's relevant. Uh, my point being here, God wants us to give him our best. For chapter 2, verses 4 through 7. Then you will know that I sent you this decree, so that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord of armies. My covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave these to him. It called for reverence, and he revered me and stood in awe of my name. True, instru and true instruction was in his mouth, and nothing wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and integrity and turned uh, many from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and people should desire instruction from his mouth, because he is the messenger of the Lord of armies. So a few things here. Um, obviously, um, the, pre the prophet was... Um, I don't know how to say this, but he was in this. He was in the place of God. Exodus puts it like this: Pharaoh, Pharaoh will you will be like God in Pharaoh's eyes. What does he mean? He means to say that when God speaks through a prophet, the prophet's words are equated with God's words. In other words, when you oppose a prophet, you were directly opposing God. That's why a lot of times when people oppose prophets and kill prophets and whatnot, they had such a harsh um, judgment come on them was because God was speaking to them through someone who he ordained to use, and that person was rejected. Um, 
But beyond that, if you notice here, God wants us to walk in peace. And he also wants us to help other people to get out of sin. Look at verse 5 again. My covenant with him was one of life and peace. God wants us to have peace in our lives. He doesn't want us to live a life that's just... You know what I mean? God doesn't want us to live a mediocre life. He doesn't want us to live a life that's full of just pain and sorrow all the time. Bad things happen, absolutely, and I'm not denying that. But God doesn't want that sorrow to define us. Does that make sense? God wants to give us a new hope. He wants to give us a new life. He wants to lead us past what we've known into something better than we've known. And in verse 5 it says there, um, It called for reverence, and you revered, my, revered me and stood in awe of my name. Then verse 6, True instruction was in his mouth, and nothing wrong was found in his lips. He walked with, um, with me in peace and integrity, and turned many from iniquity. So here we have the word again, peace, used again in just a few, uh, a few sentences here. Um, and so he wanted, he wanted, he wants us to walk in peace, but he also wants us to help others out of sin. Now, if you grew up in, in the religious atmosphere like I did, you're used to people not really wanting to help people. You're used to people wanting to tell other people all the things that they're doing wrong and how they can never measure up and how they're just worthless sinners. And I mean, I, I, I get what you're saying. Absolutely, you know. We are sinners in need of a Savior. Absolutely. But then, you know, I feel like sometimes, in fact, the majority of the time, the church atmosphere that I grew up wasn't one of actually meeting people where they are and helping them to find that Savior. It was kind of just looking down on people and trying to make them feel as bad as possible and as crummy as possible and it's like and if Jesus should come up well good news you know whatever but that's not the main point we're just here to make people feel real bad you know and, and this is that's where that's the attitude and atmosphere that I grew up in so to preach this now you know I'm 26 now this is completely different than the atmosphere that I grew up in and I think that that's kind of a terrible thing um, obviously you still have extremists but you know we are, we are called to help other people get out of sin. Drug addicts, we're called to help them, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. People who are, who are alcoholics, we're called to help them. Yeah. People caught in pornography, we're called to help them and pull them out, right? We're not called to be those people who... You know, and, and I feel like this is where it started from. We, they need to know that what they're doing is wrong. I get that. But last I checked, the Holy Spirit is the one who convicts us. And we are the ones who love people, right? But what happens is we try to step into the place of the Holy Spirit. We try and say, okay, so I see what you're doing wrong because I am so much better and smarter than you. So I need to tell you what you're doing wrong so that then, you know, you can be like me. <laughs> well, <laughs> you obviously hopefully see the, see the problem with that line of reasoning. But that brings us to a little bit of a, of a problem. See, pastors and, and leaders are called to live and teach a little bit different than lay people, normal people. Okay, for instance, let, let me, as a, I don't want to make it sound like pastors are up here, you know, I, but try and roll with me on this, okay? Just stick with me. Pastors cannot condone sin. Pastors also cannot instruct people not to change. Pastors cannot allow bitterness or teach people to allow bitterness, and pastors cannot endorse things like divorce and that and that kind of stuff. Pastors are not called to do those kinds of things. We're called to help people get back to God. That's our job, right? But the thing is, in most of life, it's more complicated than that. And so the pastor is, pastors are, are in kind of a delicate situation because... We have to stand up for what's right without being condemning. And we have to help you make your decisions without making you, well, without looking down on you for what decision you make. Does that make sense? Like, for instance, in the case of divorce, there's many reasons for divorce. I, I don't really want to get into it one way or another. I, um, I don't really want to condone it or condemn it. I'm, that's not my purpose at all. Um, but, you know, there is an extremism. And some people say, you know, um, divorce is acceptable in every situation, but that doesn't really take into account God's view of marriage. Whereas in other situations, th there are definitely reasons why people would get divorced. Like, for instance, in Ezra chapter 9, um, God's people were marrying people who were not God's people. And what was the solution? Divorce. 
Because we as believers, in fact, Paul says it like this, what fellowship does the holy have with the unholy? You know, we as Christians, we can't be in relationships with people who are not Christians. Um, you know, with, with, um, with things like, I'm going to use the example of Freemasons. Freemasons is where you, you do blood bonds and, you know, these blood oaths to, to join yourselves with these other people who aren't necessarily Christians. See what I mean? And that's not really, that, that's a good example of what Paul told us not to do. As Christians, we can't be in things like the Freemasons because we are joining ourselves with something that is not um, holy. Now, obviously, there is a distinction there. You can still do business with, with non-Christians, that kind of stuff, but I wouldn't obviously be a partner with a non-Christian. I wouldn't co-sign loans for a, a non-Christian. But then again, I wouldn't co-sign a loan for anyone. <laughs> I think that co-signing a loan is probably the stupidest thing you can do. Um, people who need a co-signer on a loan, not all the time, but a majority of the time, is because they don't know how to control their finances. So then when you co-sign a loan, you're saying, it's now my problem. And I'm all for helping people. I'm totally for helping people. We as Christians need to step out of our comfort zones, all that. But we don't need to be making financially stupid decisions. <laughs> you know what I mean? If we tie up all of our money on other people's bad credit, we won't be able to help widows and orphans and those people who need our help, right? Because our money will have been already bound up to something else for a decision that wasn't even ours. You see what I mean? Not a great idea. So then... We as pastors have to meet people who get divorced with kind of a, and I'm not just talking about divorce here, I'm talking about all these different things. People stuck in drugs and all these different things, okay? We have to meet them where they are and help them to find the way up, right? But then, when somebody takes a decision that's not right, or we don't think it's right, I should say that, because we aren't always right, right? Like, for instance, let's say, for instance, somebody gets a divorce. We can't take, the, take sides in that as a pastor. We're not called to that. And you, as lay people, are not called to take sides. In fact, I would highly, highly recommend that you don't take sides. See you know what I mean? Do everything to help people find healing and restoration. But when people make the decision to get a divorce or to quit their job or to move, be the voice of grace. You know what I mean? In a sea of judgment and guilt and shame, be the voice of grace and help them to find Christ regardless of whether they made a good decision or a bad decision. See what I mean? We're trying to draw people out of sin, right? Don't waste your time drawing, getting on sides in conflicts. That's just a huge waste of time. Why I'm spending so much time on this is because, you know, we're right around Christmas. Did you know that in the next two weeks, more than likely, something's going to happen with your family and you're going to have to, you're going to be called on to take sides in a conflict? Doesn't it happen every Christmas? <coughs> Don't do it. <laughs> I'm really wanting to spend time on this because it's Christmas. And I just really have a good feeling that this is going to happen to people. So, you know, uh, when, when people do take that take a hard decision, regardless of whether it's the right one or the wrong one, oftentimes they struggle with um, guilt. They struggle with trying to find their place and trying to hear the word of God again. Um, I, I've used the example of divorce so much, I'm just going to stay with it so I don't have to keep coming up with new, new, new material here. In the case of divorce, for instance, um, where we need to be the people who help them draw close to God. Does that make sense? But what we've done is we've said, well, the Bible says, yes, the Bible says this is an ideal. But did you know that we don't really measure up to that ideal? Did you know that? I mean, honestly, here. For instance, Jesus said that if you so much as look at a woman with lust in your eyes, you've committed adultery. Well, I hate to tell you, but 100% of all men are adulterers. <laughs> because we don't measure up to the ideal. God's telling us what the ideal is, not what you will actually be able to, you know what I mean? It's not like we're not trying to, to achieve righteousness in our lives. But when we fell, we expect God to give us grace, right? So when others fell, do we give them grace? Do you know what I mean? And so I really want to want to make sure we're all clear on that. Uh, going on to the next one, chapter two, verse ten. Don't all of us have one father? Didn't God create us? Why then do we act treacherously against one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? Now he's talking about how the Israelites were mistreating each other, but this 
applies more than just the Israelites. Um, God created all of us. See what I mean? We all were created from Adam and Eve. And then through that, obviously, the, the bloodline was, was sh shortened uh, through Noah <laughs> because of the flood. But then so we all come from Noah. So that means we're all brothers and sisters in the world, right? Which means that there's no longer um, an idea of, I don't want to, don't know how I'm saying this, but um, no longer a place of like, well, I'm going to say it differently. In schools, we're taught about evolution, you know, with different things, with monkeys and that kind of stuff, right? But in the Bible, it teaches us about how God made us in his image. What my point is, is sometimes we see non-Christians as kind of lesser than Christians. That's really what I'm trying to say here. As Christians, we don't have the right to look down on people. And oftentimes, as Christians, we do look down on people. Well, sometimes we look down on people because of economic status, sometimes because of color of skin, sometimes because of other things like we don't agree with their politics. In fact, I've met a lot of people um, who talked about being militaristic um, in their you know, views of politics and didn't really want to get involved with that. <laughs> but God wants us to love one another. So we have a few things here. God wants us to turn from evil and know his love. God wants us to give him our best. God wants us to walk in peace. God wants us to help others out of sin. God wants us to love one another. Chapter 3, verse 1 through 4 says, See, I'm going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. Then, uh, then the Lord you seek will suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant you delight in. See, he is coming, says the Lord of the armies. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who will be able to stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire and like laund uh, launder's bleach. He will be like a refiner and purifier of sil silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. Then they will present offerings to the Lord in righteousness, and the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will please the Lord as in days of old and years gone by. So God wants us to make God wants to make us new. You see the, the imagery there that, that the prophet used about being refined and purified. God wants to take us where we are, and he wants to make us into something new. See what I mean? God doesn't want us just us to just get saved. And I want to challenge you tonight to stop praying for people to just get saved. Pray for them to get saved, absolutely. But pray that God would do a work, that God would cause a mighty transformation in people's lives. Chapter 3, verse 8 says this, um, Will a man rob God, yet you are robbing me? How do we rob you, you ask? By not making the payments of the tenth and the contributions. And I don't really want to go on there. You can read it further if you want. But God wants us to wants to set us financially free. And how does he set us financially free? By putting him as the center of our finances. He wants our wealth and possessions to honor him. So ask yourself questions. How do you spend your money? Do you give God tithes and offerings? Who do you spend your money on? Is God a factor in your purchases? Do you spend money that you actually have? Or do you spend outdated out? Lost the word there. Or do you overspend on credit? Do you have outstanding credit card, uh, credit cards? See, I, see what I mean? Like, credit cards are a great indicator of where our heart is. Go back and look at your spend, at your uh, recent purchases that you spent when you didn't have the money to spend it. Did you spend a bunch of money on junk food, on things to make you happy? Did it make you happy? Did you spend your money on, you know, what, what were you spending on that credit card? And a lot of times, if we look at our purchases, we can see how we used our credit cards to buy things that we wanted, but maybe we didn't have to have. Kind of like something we were coveting, we were greedy for, so we bought it on a credit card. Um, so God wants to set us financially free. Chapter 2, uh, verses 13 through 16 says this, um, This is another thing you do. You are covering the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer respects your offerings or receives them glad gladly from your hands. And you ask, Why? Because even though the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth, you have acted treacherously, treacherously against her. She was your marriage partner and your wife by covenant. And what he's talking about here is the Israelites weren't taking their, their marriage vows seriously. They were getting married and divorced at the drop of a hat. You know what I mean? We're not, he's not talking about, obviously, about, ex, uh, you know, um, what's it called, extending circumstances like 
uh, spousal abuse. People always always ask about this. Is it okay to get a divorce about spousal abuse? And all that? He's not even talking about that. He's talking about people who weren't taking their marriage covenant seriously. We don't... I've met a lot of people in Tolerosa who just marry and divorce like that. I mean, they'll be married and divorced within two years and then with, with another person ready to marry again. And it's like, well, you know, I, I, I get where you're coming from. I'm not trying to be judgmental, but marriage is meant to be something that binds us with one person and we accept them in their bad and in their good. But what we want to do is we want, we want our spouse to meet all of our needs and understand what I'm saying. There is no person on the place on the planet Earth that's going to meet all of your emotional and spiritual needs. And it's just not going to happen. And so what happens is we look for a spouse that will complete us and that person doesn't exist. So then when they fail to complete us, when they mess up, when they do something wrong, we instantly, you know, want out. You know, and, and once again, I understand that there's a lot of reasons for divorce. I'm not, I'm not taking sides on that. I don't want to take sides on that. I, I think it's a way more complicated issue than me saying five, you know, five minutes in, in any sermon. But I do think that it needs to be stated that, that when we make a vow as Christians, you know what I mean? That that's a vow before God. Now it's different for people who are not Christians that get divorced and married because their covenant wasn't before God. See what I mean? Like the world allows for same-sex marriage too. So you see what I mean? We can't we can't look down on the world and say you have to measure up to the Christian standard. They're not Christians. Why would they have to measure up <laughs> to the Christian standard? You see what I mean? We need to instead meet them with grace and love them wherever they are, and just trust that God will do a work in their heart, right? Yeah. Isn't that the foundation of prayer? So then in chapter 2, verse 17, he says this, You have wearied the Lord with your words, and you ask, How have we wearied him? When you say, Everyone who does what is evil is good in the Lord's sight, and he is delighted with them. Or else, where is the God of justice? So God wants us to walk in faith. He wants us to turn from evil. He wants us to stop condoning evil. You know what a lot of Christians I have known do is they, they condone sin that they struggle with, but then they condemn something else. You don't know how many pastors I've heard, you know, uh, really chew out homosexuals, and then they overindulge in things like food. You know what I mean? Like, that's, that's kind of an unfair standard. You control your lust of the flesh. I'm not going to control my lust of the flesh. Well, that's not really how that works. You see what I mean? Like, we're called to control the lust of the flesh. You, you see this happen a lot with people who are getting out of addiction and, and addictive behavior. You know, they get out of the drugs, but then they just can't... Com com um, com eh, that's not the word I was looking for, but I'll use it. Why not? Um, they just use some, put something else in the place. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And we actually see that a lot, where, where you'll see someone get out of drugs, but then they'll just, you know, fill it in with something else. So the root problem hasn't changed. You see what I mean? And uh, I don't really want to get any any further in that. I think that all the, all those things I was trying to say kind of already said. So John John ten ten says that God wants us to live a life more abundant. He wants us to live life abundantly. Um, in this translation, which is the CSB, I actually want to read it. Um, John ten ten says. A thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Ad comes so that they may have life and have it in abundance. God wants us to get one. God wants us to give us something that we don't have. He wants us to have more than salvation, and he wants us. He wants to transform our lives. See, salvation isn't about sneaking somebody into heaven. Salvation is about lives being transformed. God wants to tra transform our finances. God wants to transform our marriages. God wants to transform our lives. God wants to give us a love that we've never even known. See what I mean? We try to we try to divorce works from faith. And here's the thing: we are saved by faith, not by works. But faith produces works. Faith produces works, and in those works is a life changed. We as Christians don't hold on to bitterness. We forgive people, right? We just let it go. Why? Because we've been forgiven. And because that is the works that flow from our faith. We believe in God, so therefore we forgive others. Right? Yes. So, I mean, those works are a natural result. They don't save us, but they are a natural result. Um, so, 
I guess I, you know, probably said enough. I don't know what time it is, but it's probably time to eat. Um, so, in conclusion, God wants to transform our life. Long and short of it. And Malachi never once says, just get saved. He talks about all these different areas that God was wanting to transform their life. And I think sometimes we just kind of ignore that part. You know, whatever. But it's like, no, 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 that's the whole message of the gospel. The good news is that we can be transformed. Things don't have to be like they are now. There's a hope of a future. There's a hope of something different happening. Right? We, we, we have a hope that, that, that God will save our family members. We have a hope that God will renew marriages in, in Tularosa. We have a hope, right, that, that children in the foster care system will be adopted. We have a hope that, 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 that widows and orphans will find their father as God. We have a hope, you know, that there, there, there's something that God is doing in Tularosa. We have that hope. And that's what Christianity is really based off of. The hope that God wants to transform, because that's exactly what he said that he wants to do. So, if you'll join me in prayer. Lord, I pray that you would, uh, that you would continue your work, even as we know that you've already...